Welcome to the 34th episode of Born in Trouble. I'm your host, John X. We're a little bit late with the start here, but hey, better late than never, baby, right? Absolutely. 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 So that man speaking right there, we heard is the Sea Wing King, Mr. Grant Lancaster. What up, though? What up, though? And we're going to keep it in the Midwest for Mr. Reggie Reg, my compatriot from Akron, Reggie Wood. Glad to be aboard for the Shaquille O'Neal episode. The Shaquille O'Neal episode. We're going to get deep into that. I don't know what that means. That must 34. have something to do episode with. 34. 34. Oh, that's, oh, oh, listen, this is the John X episode. I'm the original 34. What? My bad. My bad. It's the X show. Mr. You're the original Brooks. number 34? You're the original number 34? Now I'm really confused. This, <laughs> I picked a hell of a day not to do drugs before the show. <laughs> Mr. Robert Brooks. What up? Don't do drugs. The message starts already. Don't do drugs. 34, B, that was me. I was Shaq before Shaq. Basketball or football? I gotta ask. Or lacrosse. Basketball. Basketball. Oh, okay. Basketball. Okay. He he was he was not a lacrosse guy. Nah. A lot you know what's funny? Lacrosse. Craig Mack. One day he came over to me. He came back from going on a, a trip doing some shows, and he said he met Shaq, and they were shooting baskets someplace, and he told him that he could beat a that we could beat him and anybody else he wanted to, one at two on two. And all he had to do was get me, and I was going to cover him. Hmm. He, he said that? He told Shaq that, he said. That's what he said he told Shaq. Copious I, I amounts of... You probably instructed him not to talk no crazy shit like that ever again in his life? Nah, nah. I just knew nah. I was never going to meet Shaq. Not after that. If we were in the same room, I was going to avoid him. But anyway, Co- fellas, man... How y'all feeling today, man? You feeling good? It's a great day. Yeah, beautiful day in Zamunda. All right, that's what's up. Yeah, we're gonna beautiful we're gonna day in Zamunda. It. We're gonna kind of keep it basketball, and we're gonna bring it in with basketball, sort of. Reg, you're in Akron. You know anything about the school that LBJ has over there? I wasn't going to break it to you, but I'm I'm in Dayton, man. Dayton. Oh, you're in Dayton. Oh, okay. You know, I, I experienced this same thing when I was in the Navy. You know, no one could ever get Dayton right. So we just, we like the redheaded stepchild of cities in, um, mm, in, in, right. uh, in Ohio. But yeah. I need to actually, I need to look into that because I hear a lot of discussions about what I just took it for granted it was LeBron's school. If you dig into it, there's different there's different accusations and whatnot of what's what. I didn't think it really needed, I didn't think it warranted all that when it was rolled out there. So I'm not on the up and up of exactly how that's set up. Well, they they just did the state testing for math. And for eighth graders, um, the members of the school tested at five percent um math level for the state which is pretty low but in defense of the school they do take on um at risk a lot of at risk people and they offer a lot of different resources that are just family related and what's the most in response gives you an example of how far below these people that we've actually started with our students and with our kids in our neighborhoods. Rob, you got a thought about that? Our black kids? Um... Yeah, I mean, that's, t- that's, that's, that's tough, uh, you know, because when you're going to put your name on something, you know, people are going to expect results, especially from that dude. Um, education's a difficult thing, man. I mean, the way the system is set up right now, you know, I always bitch about it. It's not for us. It's not for anybody. It's for machine parts so that, you know, that his kids are testing well below grade level, I'm sure that's not all that different than what's going on in the surrounding communities there. Hmm. Like you you go to Brentwood, 
and folks that tested well below in math and math and reading. It happens in those communities. Mm. Right. You got a thought process on that? You know, well, I, I just the education system is just such a it's such a big bear. You know what I mean? I I, I would first want to know where were those children when before they came to LeBron School. Mm. Like, what were their test scores before? You know what I mean? Like, incremental improvement could have been attained. You know what I mean? But if that's fair, if we don't know the before, we don't know, we don't know the after. Yeah. That's we don't know fair. what the arc of the journey is. Yeah. I haven't seen that. And that's kind of what LeBron is saying. They offer a lot of great things like GED uh, studies for single parents or for parents of the kids. They also offer, um, I think they said it's like $160,000 per person, somewhere along that line. I don't, I don't remember exactly what it was. The reason why I mentioned this and I bring this up is because there was a superintendent somewhere I saw on, on um, TikTok or something, and he was talking about his students. And he was said, it's a black school district. And he said, these kids can't test their way out of a paper bag, essentially. They're all pretty much stupid or stupider, and they don't have a chance. And this is was the superintendent of the school district. Do you think that those type of environments, you know, and then one, you take that and you piggyback that with LeBron's test scores. Is education a key? Is this something that we're sorely missing in the black community per se? I, I think it's missing at all. What the one thing that the pandemic proved to me is that most people look at education as babysitting. Like mm -hmm. most people are interested in school in their kids schooling and as much as the fact that it gets them out of the house so they can go to work. Mm. Like there aren't a whole lot of people who are really that invested in their kids education, white or black. Mm. Like Americans, for the most part, are kind of checked out on that. And, you know, when when you find a, you can see a, a motivated group, you can it's easy to see the groups that are into their kids education because the kids respond to it and the kids mm. excel. But for the most part, it's babysitting. Hmm. Well, take that and piggyback that with the UPS. Did you see the UPS union just got a deal for their workers? 170,000 per is the total amount of the package, not just with salary, it's with medical and other benefits. So it's not 170,000 hour salary, but the package is worth 170,000 dollars yearly. And a lot of people are upset at that. People are upset. They say it's too much money to carry to deliver my package. How is it too much money to deliver your package? You want your package when you want it. Like if you were willing to wait right. four days, five days all the time, it wouldn't be that. But you, everybody wants it yesterday. So pay the man. Well, we're Amazon, in a service economy now. Amazon drivers on average make somewhere around 14 or 15 nationwide. That's like the average nation, nationwide. And yeah, that's why they're saying Bezos it's like such really a bad thing. Him any more than that. Mm -hmm. You got to keep Lauren Sanchez in, in barely their outfits, so he can't really afford to, <laughs> to pay more than that. Well, listen, if it's going to cut into that, then I, I say those people are ass out on their raises. But, um... <laughs> ass out. How ass out. Oh, I don't pull. <laughs> I don't pull. Yeah, but, but seriously, though, like, is it fair for because this is I, they, I had a long conversation with this guy online today about the fairness of UPS drivers getting one hundred and seventy thousand dollars per year in a package, and the reason why the compensation is so high is because that is really what a middle class living wage is today is one hundred and seventy thousand dollars, and people are just appalled that these drivers are going to be able to have enough money to buy a home, be able to feed themselves simultaneously, buy a new car simultaneously, even maybe even go on a vacation spot. And all they do is lift pack, lift and deliver packages. Do people have a right I'm, to be I'm not are really, people mad I'm not really at the, sure right where the word fair comes into that? Like why is it a cop why is the word fair? in there like what does fair have, have you know why 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 are we using that as the metric like so, 
you know, that and that right there, when they say, is it fair? That means somebody's already placed a judgment on that job and deemed it lower than something else. Mm-hmm. When it's a job and any job pays whatever you can get the person to give you for it. Right. Right. So, That's the biggest point right there is someone has deemed that that is the amount of money that they are willing to pay for that service. Whoever, you know what I mean? That's like what it's whoever take to keep that position right. fully staffed. Whoever's funding that, whoever's funding that service has said, "Okay, this is how much we're willing to pay for that," and, and they, and they signed the dotted line on it. Right. UPS is not hurting. They're still they're still highly profitable. Well, they're very. They were very. This one guy in particular was very upset. You know. Well, you should ask why it offended him. You should have asked. Well, he, him, what, is it, what is it about this that offends you? Well, what he or, said. What do you do? Well, well, that's right. the question. What well, do he, you do, my man? Didn't answer that question. I was, you know? like, I my my response to him was like very simple. It's like you have a lot of commentary. You you have the ability to place the value value on this person's job, yet you've never done it. So, how can you really tell me what it's worth per hour if you've never actually done that job? You don't. Or know is it another entails. one of those examples of of one of the many jobs? That Americans have sort of left behind because it's beneath them, and now they're looking right. back going, "Oh shit, we didn't left that thing. We left that thing to them," you know. Right. I mean, in my neighborhood, most of the UPS drivers now are black. Okay. Or Latin. Like, there's right. a lot of color oh, in, yeah. in, the, in the drivers' pool, where there right. wasn't when I was growing up. So, right. have they left those jobs behind, thinking, "Well, those jobs aren't those are menial jobs," and now it's allowed people of color to get themselves in the middle class, and that's what's not fair. Because their dumbass thought they were better than this, and now they're working at a job that ain't paying as well, and they're getting left behind while the colored folks is getting in the middle class. Well, if you start talking about fair, that's probably what you're talking about. It's only going to be it's only going to be a few of them. You know, they were their argument was that it wasn't that it was too much money for what they were doing. That it's just too much money. You know, Amazon drivers make X amount of dollars. Um, Amazon drivers all want to be UPS drivers now. That's right. Ain't that the truth? And Jeff Bezos is trying to replace them anyway. He's trying to replace them with drones anyway. Hell yeah. Well, and this was this was his point. He was like, well, he he ran with the same old tire tri- diatribe. You hit it right on the nose that um, they're going to be re- that when it comes time to replace people from their jobs, this is going to be the driving factor. Paying these people too much money for the drop job is going to actually draw, like, kick them away from there, and they're going to replace them with robots. And my response to that was that they're doing that anyway. They're trying to do that anyway. That has nothing to do with how much money they're paying people. How much money do those robots cost? Huh? A million. Sure. You know, you could very easily, it's really a, it's really a decision as to how you want to pay, you know, who you want to pay. And my thing was also, I was like, you must have a, a very healthy portfolio to have that point of view. And if you do, God bless you, because that's the way that business is done now. This is the way that their investment is protected. It's protected by investments in the stock market. Everyone on this panel, I hope, has some type of investment in the stock market. Am I correct? No. Um, okay. Yep. Well, dead. So, I mean, that's just the way it is. But it, is it a matter of being being a pig at a certain point? Because well, my here's point the thing. Is, Nobody cares if the corporations are pigs. UPS, quick, quick scan. So, UPS third quarter 2023 earnings. Consolidated operating profit was $1.3 billion. That's that number's down, mm-hmm. but still one point three billion dollars. Mm. This is not, you know, when that time comes, they sit that they decide that you know they need to move off of this and they need to put the drones in place because it's gonna. It'll be strictly because they're a corporation and corporations have to drive profits all the time. It won't be because they weren't making money, because they weren't making enough money. They weren't making enough money to pay dividends. They weren't making enough money to drive the stock price higher. Mm. And that is the problem. Nobody cares when the corporations are greedy, but that driver who's just trying to eat, he greedy, and he going to kill the machine. He ain't going to kill nothing. You know what else I find interesting about UPS? 
the origins of the company. We all remember back in, I believe it was somewhere around 1987, 1988. I don't know if you guys remember this, but it was a big thing. Maybe it was the early 90s, maybe 91, 92. And it was a big thing in the news because UPS was going to have to hire new people because they had given their old people stock options when they started working in the company. And based upon the number of years that you were actually working for UPS, you actually had vested stock in a company. The company was a private company at that point. They went public. And when they went public, a lot of their drivers became multimillionaires overnight. Those are a large number of the stockholders of UPS. So I think when you're negotiating with them, do you think that maybe they might have remembered, some of them might have remembered their origins? Because I'm pretty sure not everybody sold all of their stock. It's va It was valuable. Anyone? Yeah. I mean, I, so I think there, there, there's a couple of things at play. I, I think it's, first of all, I think it's a lot easier to point the finger at the individual who who kind of has a name than at the company mm -hmm. right so when you talk about how much profit the company is making as opposed to how much salary the driver is making right that's an easier finger point at the driver than it is at the corporation but because the corporation is just a corporation that don't have a name it has the stockholders that you just referred to mm -hmm. and i would be in agreement with you i think yes or at least i would hope and I hope this as, as a, as a Detroit firefighter, that, uh, when people move up into management positions from the firefighting level, that they would look back and want it to be better for the people that came behind them than it was necessarily for them. Right. Right. So, so yeah, I think I, I would agree. I think the stockholders, yeah, pr damn right. They probably looked back and was like, you know what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. keep the party going keep the party going mm -hmm. it's the thought it's the belief it's the pride reg how do you feel about that do you feel like you have a problem with the union driving up the price is what this guy was saying driving up the price in order to pay these um drivers such a high salary which is really quote unquote a living wage middle class salary i mean i don't i don't know how this guy weighs in like what it when was he in the room looking at the board of what makes this work what gets people to show up for work each day how you losing people to these to other opportunities or whatever i think that's been the one great thing about the about the pandemic is that it caused it just caused all these everything to be reevaluated you know in in the workforce and after very little movement for decades, you know, in incremental, 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 it just created this moment of uh, competition where the workers have options. Mm. And if you need people to show up and be proficient at what they do, and you need them to, sh to, to, to be reliable, you got to pay people. You know, it's, it's people in my office that came in like you, we were just saying with uh, some of the real estate in Detroit, it's not for the Detroit, the D Detroitians who've been there, the Detroiters who've been right. there. It's to attract new people, and I mean, so so it's people that came in uh, in my office sitting next to me. I don't even want to know what they make, because if I found out, I'll probably pack my shit up and get up out of there. Yeah. So it's best right. that I don't ask no <laughs> questions and just continue doing what I'm doing. But they had to pay those people what they had to because of when they, the timeline of when they came in the door. And so this dude right here, it don't matter what you how you value what these people do and what what value they add and whatever, whatever. It's it's just where we are right now to have that same person show up every day and hit all these different little metrics that we create versus we don't know who's showing up tomorrow and we gotta we gotta uh we gotta get in here and hustle to figure out how to get these parcels out on a daily basis it's just quit ordering shit. right <laughs> right 
That'll never happen. Go, go you pick, know, go, go pick all your shit up on your own then. It, it, it's just the they, they're just so deep into somebody else's money. One argument I said was very simple. He said, "Well, your employer is who's supposed to determine what your worth is." And I was like, "Yeah, well, they did. They had a negotiation, and they determined that that was what the worth was. You just don't like what that determination was." And I used for an example: someone else goes into an office and makes a thousand keystrokes a day, and they may make a hundred and seventy thousand dollars, and you'd be okay with that because they have a degree that says that they're supposed to put these same one thousand keystrokes per day in. Like there's no there's no work out there that I don't know who people think they're fooling. There's nothing new that's being creative when you're going to work in an office every day. We're all doing tasks. We're all doing nominal tasks, whether it be lifting up a box and bringing it up set, bringing it up a couple of flights of stairs, or just typing a couple of yes, yes, no's, and then getting up and going and having coffee over by the break room. It's the same thing. Everybody is doing the same. They're all doing the same repetitive task. Nobody's breaking the wheel. They're, none of these none of these positions are like irreplaceable at this point. You know, it's some people that made a choice again over the last four or five years or since the pandemic. It's some people that made a choice to leave white collar jobs, pressing buttons and keystrokes. To go be truck to go be truck drivers because it was a chance to get a twenty five thousand dollar bonus to do that, and then some people were like, "I'd rather sit in this box on these wheels and do this eight or ten hours a day, whatever it is, versus putting up with the shit in that office in that cubicle that I used to do." Mm -hmm. So it's just like I said, this this pandemic and and you know some of the ancillary stuff that popped that developed up out of it has caused us to take a look at how people value their time and, and what they do to earn a living. And it's mm. winners, it's winners and losers. Right. Well, my, my other argument was he was like, it's not fair that the unions had made them, made them, they, under the threat of a strike, they made them come to this agreement. So that what's, was the only way it came. What's more and, American uh, than that? But, but wait, my, my example was, was this. So it's not fair when the union does it, but in right to work states, you have the option of either like taking the job under your, this employer's terms or not working at all. That's fair. But when the unions do it, it's not fair. Does, we got to get to a fucking sense? hobby. You got to stop talking to people like this, man. Like you wasted <laughs> way too much energy. <laughs> like, oh, well, here's like why Listen, you why you talking this motherfucker? Like, bro, I'm not what? I'm not invested in the conversation. I'm curious as to his points of view because I I like to see the spin. You know, I like to see what how is this like you know, and also also because of the fact that he was so upset. He was the one that was upset about it. I was like, you know, congratulations, somebody finally got a job. This is what we used to expect anyway. You know, we used to expect when you when you look at the you you looked it up, right, Rob? Some of it was medical, some of it was time off, some of it was um salary and other mm -hmm. benefits, job training, whatever. The package is worth 170,000. When we used to go to work within a month, we used to expect one, two, three, or four of those aspects. Now for example, in a right to work life, our uh, work state, there's none of that. It's just the cash. It's just the money. And the reason why I'm I'm having these conversations about this stuff is because people need to people need to laugh. I I don't want to hear people bitch about s stupid shit anymore. That's it. I just don't want to hear him bitch about late. stupid shit anymore. Oh, well, the Republican right. Party's gonna hijack it. The same people who complain about immigration, the same people who complain that their fruit prices went up because there's nobody to pick it. Like, stop it. Like, the work has to be done. Somebody has to be paid for it. You don't want to do it, so the price is gonna go up. Leave right. it alone. Right. But they, but they, like, it's none of your business. But they're they're just so deep into it. Instead of just applauding them, 
you know, we don't we don't cheer for we don't cheer for each other and everything. No, That's we're a country somebody, of haters. Yeah, pure haters. Pure haters. Yeah, right? we're a country of haters. Country of haters. I mean, come on. These guys, they they got that situation. The only thing they say is that, oh, it's gonna make my Amazon package go higher. Well, maybe your Amazon package needs to be higher because you don't understand how all these things are interconnected. And I use the memory of like when I used to do mortgages, you know, back in the day, I was having a conversation with my boss and we both saw that the money was being redistributed up. Despite what they were saying, we knew it was being redistributed up and it's been redistributed up. And he was like, you know, so what? And I was like, yeah, it's not so what to me because honestly, when that money goes up, that means less people can qualify for mortgages and that's less opportunities it is for me to do business. You may be dealing, doing with business on a higher level, so you may feel like it's actually a good thing for you, but it's actually going to shrink the entire pot. And eventually it's going to shrink, shrink your pocket or it's gonna change the way you make money. Because now you won't be able to make those residuals off of the deals that me and everyone else on this team are, are making because there's less qualifiers. And this is just all the rubber hitting the road from those times. And they make these stupid statements like it's because the Democrats, it's because the Republicans, it's because of, it's like, no, it's not because of any of those things, and it's because of all of those things simultaneously. You know, but it's just like it can't be that it can't be that simple. So but it is that simple. I th I think it's it's as simple as the people that have every, that own most of the important things in this country want more, and in order for them to have more, someone has to have less. So that's to me, that's how simple it is. That's the reasoning. Yeah. I mean, the the I mean, we 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 know the seven deadly sins, right? Greed is one of them. Greed. And greed in this country is everything. Envy is one of them. Envy is who you were talking to. You know, why do why do you why are you looking at why are you looking in my pockets, my man? Why are you looking right. at somebody else's pockets? Deal with your own shit. Right. right. Let them do what they're doing over there. That don't have anything to do with you. Fill you out an application, my G. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> but but he, he can't fill out an application because another deadly sin is pride. His mm. pride won't allow him mm. to fill out the application to get the job at UPS. Look, mm. look, look. I ride my, my main riding partner, truck driver. And I that's I hear I got this discussion from talking to him, but here I am with a four year degree and then a, a MBA in in debt in my late forties with with forty some k of uh, student loans to pay, and then being a dumbass I had before all this forgiveness popped up and trying to get my payments right I went and privatized my shit so I ain't even gonna be. Able I ain't even gonna be able to cash in on none of that shit if it ever comes through. <laughs> I'm I'm sitting out here on this long ass bike ride with my partner, piecing together from what he tells me about the trucking industry, twenty five, thirty thousand dollar signing bonus, and then I'm putting it two and two together that he probably making six figures, and I'm sitting over here with what I work to get to, and I, I say all this to say. Man, the fuck up and do what you got to do and leave other people alone. You you make your bed, lie mm -hmm. in it, and it's the end of the story. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as soon as I get my CDL, I'm going to drive me a truck so I can <laughs> pay these goddamn student no. loans. Well, look, my daddy was a truck driver, and that was another conversation. That was another thing this guy, I just basically, I just, I just like, I kind of like got him in a corner. And it was like, I was like threatening to punch him, but I wasn't going to punch him. I was just like, okay, so what, why are you acting jumpy right now? I'm not jumpy. Well, why are you moving left? Why are you trying to get around me? I'm not. I, I'm not. All right. So it's like, you know, it was one of those moments. Like, you know, I just had him like I was, I could punch you anytime. <laughs> and, I, and I decided not to, but it was, it's like, you know, even that he said, 
you know, well, these move these jobs that lift up packages and do X, Y, and Z, it's not really worth that much. And I was like, yeah, my dad was a was a truck driver and an owner operator from the seventies. So I know exactly what those jobs are, exactly how much money they make and how much, how little money they make now also at the same time. See, like Reg, you described like the sign on bonuses and things of that nature that are going on because there's a dearth of truck drivers and people that want to get out there in the road. And also they're, they're not really pushing. You've got the, you've got these times when they're actually, they're trying to push for automated everything. So for you to go out and get your license right now, you're going to make, you may make like good money for the next five or six years. You're definitely going to get that good signing bonus, but eventually they're going to try to replace you with an automated truck. It's been, they've been working that way for 10, 20 years. This is just the rubber hitting the road. And what we're seeing with this changeover, what I'm seeing with the changeover of the economy, the way that things are going, is that when we get in a situation where we have a dearth of drivers and we don't quite have a solution, they just let the people suffer now because they don't necessarily need that income. They don't need the money from like going in delivering food to these stores or to these places. It doesn't, it doesn't suit them to do it. The cost analysis, it doesn't make sense. And when my father was working, when they were doing moving jobs, they were making a lot of money, you know, and then the corporation started eating more of it and eating more of it and got to the point where towards the end, wasn't worth it. He wasn't working enough to, and, you know, have his own truck and still be paying all his other stuff. So he sold his truck and worked as a driver for another company towards the end. But he had made a lot of money over the years because it changes up. And they've changed all of these things. And it's not just trucking. It's every industry where you have independent contracting. Computer people, a lot of people who are doing computer work were laid off right before December, right before Christmas. This is how there, there are patterns as to how the way that these corporations work and people accept it is basically what I'm saying. So if you accept it, why are you bitching about it is really what I was saying. Well, look, look. Yeah. I, look, I would look. say, I would say that it is too pronged though, because the corporation ha has something to do with it for certain, but there's also the, the labor force that has something to do with it too. So. For every, and I, I read this, so it, uh, like the, the numbers could be wrong, but it, I'm sure it's something close. So for every 10 uh, construction workers that you have, building houses, building whatever, every 10 construction workers that you have, when, when there's only three that are going to replace that 10. Right, because because that trade is not the trade is not valued anymore, the way it once was, right. So when you think back to what Rob said earlier about though somebody somebody decided we're gonna leave those jobs behind, mm -hmm. right? But you can't leave you can't leave the jobs behind. Someone is gonna still have to do the work at some point. Somebody's still gonna have. I don't care how many how many automated trucks they put on the road. There's still gonna be some person that has to drive a truck somewhere because the automated thing ain't going to be able to get there or for whatever reason. I mean, we the hell of problems that they have with the, with this automated driving thing anyway, who knows when that's going to come into fruition. But just like I said, with like construction, man, like if you don't have the people to, to do it, you don't have a, you don't have the apprenticeship kind of, you know what I mean? The, the, people to learn from someone the programs else and the programs and right. in place to yeah. replace and for all the jobs that are coming up in the future, the way that the things right. that the way that unions used to work, right. Where they so, have and, apprentice programs and they bring you in and then exactly. you go from next to whether you're a plumber or electrician. Exactly. Uh, and the bottom yeah. line is everybody suffers. So, so the corporation and its greed coupled with, the labor force and the, and the lack of kind of interest in being in the labor force, you know, so, so what do you get? You're going to have to pay a premium for whatever you get. But it's not because worth there's money, only going to be so many people, but it's not worth that much money though. 
that's the whole point. It's not worth that much money. It is it's worth it a is. lot less. It's, it's, it's a worth. Lot less. It's worth how much money somebody's willing to pay for it. Exactly. Well, look. ain't hurting. It. Ain't hurting their profits. Somebody, somebody told me a long time ago, money is only an issue in the absence of value. Okay. So if okay. you can make somebody believe that is valuable, they will pay for it. Look at the uh, look at the call center game in like the late nineties. You know, it was something where you didn't need to have a college degree necessarily, but you could have this white collar job and and this office job, not be doing back busting uh, labor for ten or eight or ten hours or more a day. And the, and the call center game was cool. And then they shipped all that stuff over to India and wherever, and and to to lower the cost. And then, you know, a few years into that, Americans were complaining that I don't want to talk to this person over here. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't know. And then they had to bring all that stuff back. And it, yeah, you know, they ain't brought it back. Well, it's, not all, it, it's not all back. They, ain't, they, they, had, they ain't coming back. No, but they had to make some they had to make some adjustments. It, like Grant just said, they had to. There's some amount of that workforce that they had to come back in the event that you got a you got somebody that's irate and we need to get them to an American. So no, it's not the same numbers, but they brought back some of it. Well, Rob, uh, didn't your didn't your mom do something with that? My mom set up call centers in the Dominican Republic. She started doing them in Puerto Rico and then they wanted cheaper labor. And she was in, you know, the building that she was in, she's like, you know, every single building and you know, every single company in the building, AT&T, Verizon, like they're all setting up their call centers down there because you know, the average, like the average salary in the Dominican Republic was like a hundred dollars a month, $200 a month. Mm -hmm. So why am I paying you almost a hundred dollars a day when I could be paying a hundred dollars a month yeah. down there? Mm -hmm. Come on now. You get many more employees. And get all the employees you want. And rum drinks for lunch. Rum drinks. Well, if, you, if, you, if you set up close enough to downtown, I mean the the that's the show right there. Mm. You know, if you're anywhere near the Haragua, that's a show. See, my my whole thing with this, with having this conversation with this person, was that I wanted to get to a point. Did get to the point because he just kind of um, gave up. I looked on his page, military. I won't say which branch, but it's supposed to be the smarter branch. He just wanted to, you know, cast his aspersions and throw well, it it's, out It's there. interesting that you use the word cast because that's where his mindset is locked in the cast system. It really is. And he's got, he's got mm. people who are beneath him. And regardless of what it is that they do, they don't deserve that much money. Exactly. And that was really what, it, that was really what I was trying to drive out of him and get him to just basically come out and just like, just admit it. Like, hey, this is where you are mentally this is what you think nothing that you're talking about in in terms of the economy is going to help i wanted to bring out the economics of racism it's the economics of racism it's the economics of classism it's the it's just a how being a hater basically holds back everyone in the united states of america he was the perfect example of how being a hater actually was holding him back. He couldn't see the forest for the trees. The jobs that are actually going out, they're going out anyway. They're planning on getting rid of as many of us as they possibly can. If they can replace you with a computer or another program or something that knocks out 20 jobs, that's what businesses do. They, what they don't do is they don't worry about how you're going to feed yourself after you leave their employ. That's your problem, right. not theirs. Right. So stop pretending like these people have an answer for you. Somebody's going to come in and save you. The conversations that the people should be having are completely and totally different than the ones that we're having because they're the conversations are outdated. Living wage jobs, there's there aren't that many jobs. There aren't that many jobs at UPS. UPS is the only place that's going to pay their drivers like that. Everybody else is still going to, you know what I'm saying? Go pick up them full bands of hail along with that box and just bring it out there and just sort it out in the field for me. You going to pay me extra for that, boss? 
I think I already did. I gave you a job, didn't I? Mm-hmm. That's the mentality. And that's the mentality. And that's the world. So hey. See, here's a more disappointing fact in the world for me. Like idiots are idiots. But East Tennessee State University has invited a very glamorous and informed speaker to speak at their campus on February 8th. They've invited Kyle Rittenhouse to speak about the Second Amendment and the the errors of the ways of the BLM movement. Hmm. Now, if ever there was a person who was qualified to talk about none of that, he is it. <laughs> you know, and the fact that we continue to put him up on a pedestal continues to show you all the ways in which this country oh. gets it continuously wrong around law enforcement. Because here is a young you know, white boy who left, who left the safety of his home with an automatic weapon to go protect somebody else's property, shot somebody. And then pretended to be the victim. Let me ask you a yeah, question. Yeah, if state. you had stayed in your house, motherfucker, if you had stayed in your house, you'd have never been in trouble. <laughs> in Rob, let me ask you a question. You in another state. What? Let me let me ask you a question. Are you outraged by that? Or am I outraged by that? Yeah. I, I find it to be one of the most ridiculous things I've seen. In like a it just shows you way. the absurdity. It shows you the absurdity of the American mindset. What Thank school? You. East Tennessee State University. See, the, the reason why I asked you that question is because the reason why people like do that and give him such a platform is because they want you to be outraged. But you're an intelligent, educated man. So you recognize it for what it is. You see the makeup that they're putting on their faces whenever they decide to allow this person to come and speak on What's he speaking on? Racial the Second Amendment and the errors of the BLM movement. Whatever, nigga. Really? Like, yeah. yo, <laughs> nothing else. <laughs> like, no. like, look, you it's don't want to hear me. Like, don't even use words with the letters B and L in them. Like, don't don't say anything is black. There's nothing black. It's a very dark, um, not opaque color. Like, is Kyle gonna? Is Kyle gonna explain to us how, like, you know, who actually are the black people involved in BLM? Are we ever gonna identify who those actual individuals are in BLM, or is it just basically the idea of a multicultural, um, non-binary white male who identifies as a black guy? And his girlfriend, who has a lot of patchouli oil and some suspenders on. Is that BLM? I have no idea. Can that be BLM? Can that represent BLM? Because I, oh, I don't I mean, see, listen. It's, it's America, so, you know. Dr. Dr. King, his holiday passed last week. His son passed, I believe, two days ago. You know what I'm saying? Rest in peace, his youngest son. Mm-hmm. And the simple fact of the matter is we no longer, they, we, we don't have any black leaders per se, one individual leader. So what we have is we have a system in a society that actually has white people that will pay for an organization or a group to represent us, as long as we represent and we agree with the same things that they agree with, to give other white people a target at black people who are not really interested in it. We're busy like laughing at a lot of this shit, like Kyle Rittenhouse being this person. Nobody give a fuck about what that boy do. He just know he better, they just know he better not try it like, you know, someplace else, whatever. And everything, and honestly, like Rittenhouse, that was like we we talked about it on the show. Whoever tried to grab his gun, like what the fuck? Who does that? That wasn't a black person that grabbed his gun. That was another white guy. So now you've got a white person going to a conservative white school to address a black organization created and funded by mainly by white people 
that yes. made himself famous for shooting a white guy. Two white guys. Do you say BLM or BDL? What what, what acronym are we dealing with? Whatever. <laughs> Yeah, it's the same <laughs> thing. It, I, I would feel a lot better if he was talking about BBLs. Right. And, I mean, but, but I mean, but honestly, like, but BLM. Do you claim BLM? You know what I'm saying? Like, is that an actual organization? Did they actually do anything other than like you know? It, it's not to me. It was, who are the, who are the leaders? What are you talking about? You know what I'm saying? What what did the organization do? You know and what did they do other than accept money from white liberals? So I have a question. Who who are the white leaders? You know what I mean? Like it, we don't we don't have black leaders, but who, who are the Klan. white leaders? What up though? It used to be Mitch the McConnell. United States. Who who are the Chinese leaders? What and, up um, though? Oh, you know who else is who one the of Latin their leaders? leaders? What you up though? Who else is one of their leaders? <laughs> I'm, Tim I'm Scott. Just saying. Tim Scott's the I'm white just leader. Saying. Tim Scott. Tim, Tim why, Scott. Why, why yeah. black people need to be led? Tim, no, Ukraine? listen. Who do you no, Ukrainian Scott, lead? Scott needs to be led? Did you see? Did you see that woman he didn't got engaged to? No. Who? Tim Scott. He got engaged. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. Really? Yeah. He dropped out of the race, and then remember he introduced his girlfriend to the world a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. So he he's now engaged to her. I guess he's trying to to shore up his credentials. I see. He's uh, trying to should, get that VPZ. Exactly. Exactly. He's trying to secure his credentials in case his name comes up with a BP. Oh. Well, you know, Jason, Jason, he got a little bunny. Gonna co sign the form. All right, he got a little bunny. All right, go ahead. <laughs> a little forty-seven year old bunny. Shit, yeah. kid. Uh -huh. try, to have, try to have that shotgun wedding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he gonna have that shotgun wedding, all right. Listen, Jason Whitlock is gonna. He's gonna sign. He's gonna co sign the form, so that makes it all good. Because that's those are the leaders of white America, Jason Whitlock, Tim Scott, and any other black guy who dis, who dares to open up his mouth and speak bad about black Americans. Those are the white leaders. Those are the guys that they follow, at least around us, because they're like, yeah, because those black guys are even seeing in themselves. Larry Maybe Elder. I'm not so bad. Larry Elder. Larry Elder. Is he still alive? Yeah. I saw Tavis yeah. Smiley on TV like a week ago. I I was shocked. I forgot he was still breathing. You yeah. on PBS or something? Yeah, Tavis Tavis is deep underground now. Yeah, he he got his radio show in LA, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. But he you know he was he was trying to get something together, but you know I can't. You know I think he got the 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 whole Me Too thing. I think it was a step too far when it took him down. Uh, because I don't think yeah. it didn't sound like his crimes really rose to the level of of criminal activity it sounded like he just you know a little office nookie like you know shit you, you're around some people all the time like shit gonna jump off sometimes a little office um, nookie. but if the the shot that he and you know and he and cornell went after obama it was like come on man ain't no reason for from for this black on black crime right well that was like, y'all get, get jason, that, jason what? What was the guard he was blocking for them that's what he does so, what happened to the uh what, what was it the national black caucus or something that Tavis yeah. used to oh, oh, came be. crumbling what, down what he lost his job at PBS yeah, yeah. Well, it's unfortunate that race hustling has become such a big thing in the United States of America and it's not just with black become? people it's not just with become black people it's with all people that's what they do we've got you've got people the country like, is built on race hustling yeah you, you think so yeah. Yeah, the country is definitely built on race hustling. Okay. Well, somebody like I heard you speaking on wisdom before when you brought up Gerard Mayo, new coach of the New England Patriots. And he made the quite the uh, controversial statement when he said, When I hear people that say they don't see color, I'm automatically weary or something like that because right. you know, you have to right. see color. <laughs> right. Because you're lying. You got all in New England. He got all New England clam chattered up in one day. <laughs> See, Rob, you been to Boston? <laughs> it was they was already chowdered up. They was already fired up. Like Boston is one of those cities where the division runs deep, mm. you know. And that, but they're very polite about it, regardless of the fact that they got a, a black governor and Deval Patrick, whatever. 
that Boston is Boston is nasty, man. They there was a documentary on HBO last month about um there was a shooting in Boston. This guy, um, the claim was that a black guy jumped in the back of his, his him and his wife's car, made them oh. drive into the projects, and then he shot them both, killed the wife, shot the husband, um, and it was all made up. He did it. He killed mm-hmm. the wife. Yeah, and they, I remember they that story. Tore up the neighborhood looking for this dude. Like he gave the most generic description, you know, black guy around six feet wearing Adidas tracksuit. Uh, and the documentary was like, <laughs> that was everybody in Boston. That was every young black man in Boston at that time. Like literally, it could have been anybody. Brown skinned dude in Adidas mm. tracksuit. He's like, everybody was wearing one back then. But what year but was that? This was there. This was during the crack days. So it would have been like late 80s, okay. early 90s. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a it's a documentary on NBA. You probably got watch it on on Max right now, um, but Boston's one of those cities, man, where they're already cranked up about race all day, every day, anyway. Oh. Like, remember that is where America started. So when they try to tell you that Boston isn't like that, just know y'all started this shit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Chris Addix, go ahead. We don't have to stay on it long, but I was just gonna say that City on a Hill was a little underrated, in my opinion as a series that was on Showtime. Kevin Bacon. Boston's a tough place, man. Like we, here in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia area, we always say the two cities are very similar. But like the difference is Boston is, so like I've been in Philadelphia since, essentially since 1988. I'm still an outsider. I'm still not a Philadelphia person. In Philadelphia, you start talking to somebody, first thing they want to know is where'd you grow up? And then they want to know what parish you grew up in. Because it's not enough to know the neighborhood. They got to know which church you attended. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have that answer, you ain't part of it. But in Boston, it goes even deeper than that. Like Boston, you could be there for 100 years and not be a member of the society there. You're still an outsider there. Like it's tribal in Boston. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, if you see, if you ever saw the, um, the documentary on Bill Russell and the shit that he had to endure. Mm-hmm. Literally. Mm-hmm. Like literally the shit that he had yeah. to endure. That motherfucker right. was the MVP, and they were sit they were sitting there in the garden clapping for his ass, and then going and trashing his house, leaving feces, leaving in feces bed. in his, on his bed, and he was bringing yeah. chips. Yeah, well, they should he should have appreciated the fact that they took the time to go to his house and sit on his bed. But um, over and under on Gerard Mayo, does he make it in New England? All Is depends on what talent work? his GM gets him. This draft pick is gonna be crucial. They got a, they got what th- third pick or fifth pick or something. Yeah, he'll he'll do he'll do three years. Give he'll him do three, three years. years. Yeah, and the reason I say that is just because it's regardless to what he does. I mean, unless he just check. wins out the gate, right? Like he got he got a he got to do a D'Amico Ryan's out the gate. If he doesn't do that. It won't be good enough. It's not yeah. Belichick. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's a it's gonna be a tough division. And if they were gonna be good, Belichick would stay there. Everybody knows that he's chasing those last 14 wins in his career. So if he felt like the team was had any type of talent whatsoever, he'd probably stick around. So that just tells me that the cupboard is probably bare in New England. They're playing in a tough division. I don't I don't think that the team has some talent. I, I think it's been time for him to move on. Like it right. was yeah, his you know, message was not being the front heard office anymore. and the his battles with the front office. Like there there comes a time where you've been hollering enough, they stop listening to you. You know, I work with a dude who is absolutely brilliant. He is when I say he is good at what he does, when I say he's good at what he does, he is great at what he does. And everybody acknowledges that. But he bitches a lot. And so folks have a tendency to tune him out. And when they talk about him, they don't give him all the respect that he's due because essentially he's a pain in the ass. He's become mm-hmm. a pain in the ass. And Belichick, you know, is now a pain in the ass to Robert Kraft. I think everyone's a pain in the ass to somebody right now. We're all pains in the asses. Well, the good thing for you is that I'm your pain in the ass. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> absolutely, actually true. <laughs> Actually, very true. Give me credit for that. Well, look, we're almost at an hour. Them. 
Is there anything else you guys wanted to talk about? You know, I, I, I thought now. I was going to get in here and I was going to get a little bit deeper into some of these things and expose some of the mysteries of the world. But the bottom line is that it's probably smarter not to do that anyway. Nobody's going to listen. They're going to do dumb stuff anyway. We'll just see what happens during the election year. It's going to be interesting. Over and under That's on, for sure. Over and under on gunshots on election night. Over a hundred, <laughs> under a hundred. <laughs> over a hundred. Right now, man. Like I, you know, I've turned on CNN for a little bit when I got home, and hearing some of them fools coming out of the out of the booths in New Hampshire talking about. I think Trump's got the the right ideas to unify to reunify this country. This country's gotten away from us, and Trump's got the best ideas to reunify us. I'm like, whoo! I'm glad he's going on TV. I wish I could take pictures of him all so I could just put them up. Like, I right, avoid that motherfucker there. Oh, next time I'm in New Hampshire, avoid that motherfucker right there. But it's it's when you hear stuff like that. That's why you know you have no hope in dealing with the individual that John was chopping it up with on his labor shit. Like the way that people process information and 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 look at two people looking at the same thing and to have such uh, polar opposite opinions or interpretations of what you're looking at is just it's pointless. Oh well, you know he couldn't deny. He couldn't deny the fact that I was making points. He couldn't oh, you deny had his foot on his You had his foot on his neck. You know, I, I, I loved it because I saw I saw somebody that was like, what I saw was, I saw an open wound and an opportunity to pour some salt in it. So I took it. You, you saw the average idiot in America. Who yeah, you ain't thought got he was smarter than what wounds. he is. Huh? You ain't got enough salt for all them wounds, man. They all think they're smarter than they are. No, no, no. But you know what? I don't have enough time for them either. I was only, I only did it this morning. It was only this morning. That was it. And it wasn't even all day. It took, it's about 45 minutes and everything. Yo. 45 minutes while I'm eating my bagel. Damn, 45 minute bagel? How big is that yeah. bagel? Yeah, like, was I, I it, got was it like, yo. like bacon, egg, and cheese on it? <laughs> yo, I, yo, I do that too. Man, the bagels around the corner at the at the supermarket around the corner, best bagels ever, anywhere. I'm not going to say where, because if there's anybody listening, I don't want to see my bagels be gone. So I don't tell the people where I go around the corner. Is that a king, what, is, what is that's not King Cullen anymore. Whatever, whatever, bro. Shut the hell up. <laughs> Shut the hell up. I will mute your fucking microphone right now. Hey, who doesn't want to get good shit. bagels, man? I live I live out here, man, where good bagels are hard to find. B, these bagels are good. I got there early this morning. They were still warm. They were yeah, still nice. warm. Warm rolls. I killed it, bro. That's nice. I killed it, man. Delicious. Anyway, I went to this trouble. Lebanese restaurant the other night, and they had some fresh bread, and the guy was like, I picked it up. He put it. He just put it in the wrapper. He's like, "We we were a bit we're busy tonight, so we had to put we had to wrap them up while they're still a little bit warm." He's like, "Take that home, take it out, you know, because it's getting a little moist right now." He's, "You're gonna love that." Oh, it was tremendous. It's like this Afghani bread. Oh, mm. so Gotta good. Love me. Sesame seeds on it. Oh, gotta love it, bro. Well, I enjoyed the thirty-fourth episode. Mm -hmm. Wasn't as powerful as I wanted it to be. The John X episode. It didn't break it down the way I wanted to break it down. I'm gonna have you to. That just means we're just gonna have. What? What? You can't break it down the way you want to break it down, Holmes. Why? What do you? Why? Why can't I just give everybody? It's just... Here's the thing. Here, here's the here's the unfortunate thing, right? You you engaged in an argument with an idiot for a little while today, right? Because you well, enjoyed it. It wasn't that. really an argument. You it dropped really thirty-five an argument. on you, the guy. You were, you were, it was well, like, 45 right. minutes on this dude. From the outside, it's hard for people to tell which one is which. Like <laughs> when you get when you roll in the mud with pig, you both get dirty. So sometimes it gets oh, hard man. for people to tell which one is which. But the thing yeah, but I wasn't. But I wasn't. He was just he was just like saying stupid stuff. And I was just like pointing out that they that the world of these people who supposedly are supposed to be 
paying attention to taxes, jobs, employment, all these things that you're supposed to be experts on, you actually have no idea what's going on from a day on a day-to-day -day basis. What you do have is you have quips, you've got um, quick answers, you've got stupid um, reverse psychology things like, you know, trying to make people feel, you know, how to make the person like prove a false narrative. You know, first time I bite into one of those things when a guy goes, okay, why don't you prove this to me? I'm like, no, motherfucker, what am I, your goddamn dictionary? You can figure it out. You know what I'm saying? Right. Nobody is, nobody is. I'm, but they can't. I'm not going to explain this shit to you, you dumb fuck. Yeah, but they can't figure it out. Yeah, you figure it out. They that can't was, figure it out. They're interested in really figuring it out. Otherwise, they would have already. No, they can figure it out. They already know what it is. No. They already know what the answer is. They just say that because they just want to be, um, what is it, um, counterproductive? They combative. just want to be combative or whatever. And it's like I'm not even interested in engaging you on that level. That would that would mean that I that I honor your intelligence and your point of view, and I don't. I don't. There, there, there's a reason that newspapers are written at a third grade reading level. Yeah. Well. You know, there's a reason that that's that becomes the thing, though, John. Do you feel like somebody can go on there later tonight, or eight hours later, or tomorrow, and they get to your part of the thread, and they're like, "Man, it's John X Cat. He he got some great work right here that you just left for free." It, yeah, it, well, because I did, because well, I did listen. it, I did it myself today on uh talking about Eric the Enemy. You know, I, I'm like, man, I left some good shit out there. That that some columnists could use columnists could use some of my shit that I put it that I left in in print. Honestly, honestly, it happens all the time, and I don't really care about that because that's what I want. I would rather have somebody else take the credit for a smart idea than me get the credit for having a smart idea. Just like you know, just think about it. As long as these motherfuckers think about it, I don't really care where the source comes from. It would be nice if at some point somebody were to say, hey, this guy is like, he's talking about X, Y, or Z first, but I know that's not how it works. I'm not trying to monetize. They're all trying to monetize everything that they're doing at every second. So of course they're going to, you know, take somebody's point of view and make it their own. It happens in sports all the time. Hell, uh, this guy just got traded. Terry Rozier just got traded and I put him in a net trade just like two days ago. And people were saying to me, what makes you think that Charlotte even wants to trade him? And I'm like, duh. I'm saying because the fucking parameters are right there. I pay attention to the actual, what's actually going on, the minutiae as to like some of these things, it's not really complex, but they they're making people so stupid you, they can't see the obvious things that are right in front of them and that's the problem you know and people are going to have to educate themselves because like you said rob they're not trying to educate it's a babysitting service they're not trying to educate you they don't want Maybe. you to be able to figure that out on your own so you're on your own with figuring that shit out like honestly I'm just trying to help people by either making them feel so stupid that they're just like, wow, why couldn't I see that? Or maybe it's the opposite, though. Maybe it's that the only thing that they can see is the obvious shit that's right in front of them. Yeah. And they'll ne so they'll never see it because the shit, the shit is like it's multifaceted. There's minutia. You know, the basis of the conversation, I'm running over a little bit right now, but the basis oh, we're going to run over a lot. Yeah, but the basis, I'm going to probably edit this down anyway. But the basis of the conversation was really based upon living work jobs. And the guy was, how much money do you think is like, you know, after I got, how much money do you think is like a fair living wage? And I was like, well, if you can make over 65% of your DTI, with 65% of your DTI, you can pay all of your bills, be able to have a car and do all that stuff. And then you have that other 35%. So that way you can live a normal life. That would be a number. But whatever the figure is doesn't matter. But the DTI does. And that's why the 170,000 number doesn't matter. Now, if you can figure out other, the part of that that's unspoken is if you can figure out a way to actually take inflation and turn it into deflation, 
then the number doesn't have to be that high. Yeah, well, but it, so he, but he, he, so some people, no matter how much money you give them, they still going to be broke. Yeah, indeed. Right. Yeah. So at at the end of the day, the hundred seventy thousand. I mean, if somebody somebody that was working at UPS, I don't know what their number was before, but let's say it was one hundred thirty five. Somebody at one hundred thirty five was doing just fine. Mm -hmm. Somebody at one hundred thirty five was struggling like a motherfucker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now they bump it up to 170. That person that was doing great at 130, that that was doing well at 135, is going to be doing great at 170. Yeah, they padding their retirement now. They're like, yeah. Woo. That person that was struggling at 135, going to struggle at is going to struggle some more. And you know what? It's funny. It's funny. I guess we are going to have to go over a little bit because we were told they were they came out with a report that said um, more men over 50 now have over a million dollars in their um in their portfolios there are more millionaires yeah. that are over 50 but it's actually the one percent that's actually driving that number and it's also a lot of people who during the pandemic the reasoning is that during the pandemic everybody got these checks and a lot of people didn't have to pay x y or z and they were able to take that money and invest that money that they were saving by not going out and things and going out and all the expenditures being lower because of covid and they actually made a little bit more money and they've seen an actual boost. Whereas if you go down 20 years, those people are actually struggling worse than before, than ever. I, I would think it's because the value of everybody's houses went up because that's how most people become millionaires through the value of their home. Okay. That's and, a and two years ago, you know, for you, when the pandemic hit, a house that, and I'll use my own place as an example. The, play, the value of my place has more than doubled since the pandemic. Mm. More than doubled. Like it's gone up in value more between 2020 and 2023 than the value went up between 1985 and 2020. <laughs> yeah. Like, wow. It's ridiculous how these, how these numbers have gone through the roof. And so that's, well, that's bumped up everybody's portfolio, everybody on paper is worth a hell of a lot more money now just because you know i got one dude he wants to he wants to sell his house but he's like i make a great number but where the hell am i going to buy right he's like i have to move to like right. rochester or someplace right. to buy yeah. to, so that i can enjoy the money that i made off of this right, right. well and, and that, that's the other and that's the other part of the issue is like you know from a serious standpoint i was a mortgage banker and i did discuss that aspect of it before and i am a realtor so I understand better than most that if you don't, if you sell, you've got to, you know, the prices of everything that you're selling is like, they've gone up. Like I've got a guy that's trying to make a deal right now. He wants to move into a bigger place. He needs a bigger place. He's got a nice location, but the equity from out of that house is not going to be enough for him to move into a brand new house and, you know, paid, even though he's going to be moving from what is quote unquote, a better neighborhood into what is quote unquote, a worse neighborhood but he needs the space, but the numbers are not even equal. They're not even close. He is going to take on a lot more money than what he was previously had taken on. That's just the economics of it. Everything is just bigger. It's just wider. It's got nothing to do with Democrat or Republican other than the fact that both sides have decided that having discussions about legislature, about things that are going to take the pressure off of the American people are off the table. That's the only thing it has to do with them. Both sides have decided that they're not going to have any conversations whatsoever about fixing your financial situation in the United States of America. And if you think it's going to change because one guy gets in or another guy doesn't get in or whatever, you're sorely mistaken. The reason why it's not changing is because you're not making any noise about it. You're not putting any pressure on these people. These people can win your votes based upon something that you actually feel emotionally, not about what is actually the best for you or the best for your neighborhood or even the best for your country. If you say it's the best for your country, you're just fucking fooling yourself. It's not what's best for your country. A healthy economic system and a healthy economy is what's best for your system. And neither one of these guys is going to provide it for you because 
They get all this shit written up by the lobbyists and the corporations and the companies that pay them, whether they be Democratic or Republican, and it's the same shit. So stop wasting my time with that bullshit. If people really want to actually do something about it and have actual conversations about these things, I'm going to be here. It's basically the point. I'm going to be here. Until that time, I'm just going to make jokes about Boston. Or in trouble. We've been talking about greed a little bit. And okay. like, does somebody got to put a stop to common? Like, Badu had Angela ride. Now he's dating Jennifer <laughs> Hudson. I'm like, oh, brother. <laughs> you gotta leave something with somebody else. Um, you forgot about you forgot down. about Serena. It's Serena slow too. Down, yeah. like, well, like, come on, man. Slow down, Tommy. Born in trouble, thirty fourth episode. Mister Brooks with the good looks, Reggie Wood and Grant Lancaster. Thank you very much. I can't give you a longer exit because we're already being there an hour and fifteen in. Talk to y'all later. Peace. Deuces. Okay. And my man comes on TV like, you know, expressing love for Jennifer Hudson now. Like, yeah, God. fall in love and everything. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. I don't, but, I don't, I don't blame show. him. He went on her talk show. And so she was like, you know, she got all, all in the Barbara Walters mode. I got it. I'm the host. I got to ask this question. Are you dating anybody? And he got all coy and shit like, yeah, you know, the person I met, you know, I'm dating the most beautiful woman that I've ever met.